going to give an update on what's coming up with Leap 5.0. A lot of my time now is spent on EOCVM, but beyond that, focused on still supporting Leap and particularly on instant finality that I've been working closely with Guillaume on. So Leap 5.0, Antelope Leap 5.0, this is a the second hard fork release that we're doing as as far as as far as the as far as the ENF has done for ES. So the first one was Leap 3.1. That was the one that kind of split us off from the old code base and signaled to the to everyone that ES is now separate separated from the past and the and the community is now driving development of the code. So if you remember that was last year, September, late September, that the feature was activated, the protocol features. And so now a year later, a little more than a year later, we're planning another hard fork release. And that's what will be included in Leap 5.0. The main feature in Leap 5.0 is instant finality, which is, I guess, what we're going to, Kim and I are going to talk about right now a little bit, go into that a little bit. There are other features as well, but that's the primary, the most exciting one really is instant finality. I will mention one other thing that is close to me as far as a secondary feature, though, in 5.0, I won't mention them all. One of them is, uh, selectively leveraging ESVM OC. Uh, so we've long had ESVM OC, OC standing for optimized compiler, as a separate runtime beyond the baseline of ESVM JIT that is better optimizing the WASM contracts that are deployed on chain to make them run faster. And that has been an option available for nodes to run, private networks to run, but we have recommended and still continue to recommend that VPs and, and some other nodes on the public network do not run it because there's some edge cases, some some issues that could be a concern on a public network where anyone could just deploy a contract. However, with 5.0, we are introducing the ability to selectively leverage ESVMOC, which could then allow all nodes to use that to speed up particular contracts, contracts that are managed by the BPs, the ones that are deployed on the accounts starting with EOSIO dot as a prefix. Uh, and so that's particularly exciting because the EOSEVM is deployed on a on the account EOSIO.EVM. And so this is actually the primary purpose for why we've prioritized this for 5.0 is that we could leverage ESVM OC to speed up ESEVM, the ESEVM contract and get uh, even greater performance from that. So I'm really excited about that. There are a few other smaller features as well that are already done, kind of included as part of that. But the most exciting feature is this instant finality feature, which is a consensus upgrade. It's, a, it's actually a really big upgrade. It's the first time in ES's history that we're changing the consensus algorithm. So yeah, I think with that, I'll we hand off to back to Yom so you can talk about instant finality. Yeah, for sure. Thanks thanks for that, I guess, introduction to that new feature. I've heard a little bit through the grapevine, and I'm also very excited about the selective ESVM uh, OC. That's, that's something that's going to be really cool for, for a number of uh, <laughs> a number of uh, purposes. So really, really excited to see that come, uh, come to life as well. Um, coming back to instant fidelity, this is, this is something we've been working on for quite a while now, and uh, we're really in the, I guess, like in the thick of it now. It's we we discussed it a little bit on I, I think a couple of weeks ago, but there's there's just so much to so much to talk about about that feature. There's we we call it instant finality. This is the name that typically people have been using to refer to this upgrade. But in reality, what we're what we're really doing is we're introducing the hot stuff consensus mechanism to to leap, and the hot stuff consensus mechanism is an algorithm that was developed back in the day in 2018 by VMware. Uh, I think I've mentioned that on the previous Fireside chat, but just as a, a refresher. And it was selected by the Libra cryptocurrency project that was sponsored by Facebook and that didn't didn't see the ended up seeing the light of day. But that was that was at the at the their conclusion as they spent all that time to do uh, research on various consensus mechanisms and they selected that one because I had some some very very interesting properties, and it was really one of the I guess state of the art consensus models out there, and it, it still is today. That's still probably one of the best, if not the best, that currently exists. And when we started working on the instant finality proposal, Eric and I were discussing various options, and Eric actually was a very big proponent of, of hot stuff and uh, convinced me essentially to to. Uh, 
basically like build instant fidelity on hot stuff. At the time I was considering doing something that looked a little bit more like Casper, the Ethereum 2.0 consensus model. But after, after a few discussions with Derek, it became very clear that hot stuff was the, the main contender and probably a better, most definitely a better choice. So thank you, Eric, for convincing me. I was, <laughs> I was a little bit skeptical at first, but didn't take too long. And now I'm, I'm, I'm very glad we're doing it that way. And there, there's beyond instant finality, which is definitely a, a great feature to have, to have block finality that occurs near instantly. The hot stuff consensus algorithm has this property called optimistic responsiveness, which allows you to, as a network to reach finality pretty much as fast as the network will allow it. So it's kind of, you have to do a few uh, back and forths between your finalizer nodes, the, the nodes that will decide on the finality status of, of a block or a proposal, but it essentially allows you to reach that finality state as fast as network will allow. So this is quite, this is quite interesting because most of the other consensus models out there, they have a, a it basically takes a certain period of time that is usually like fixed or that, that like a specific interval that is required to wait until all the nodes agree on the finality status of a block. But here we're essentially able to do it as fast as we, uh, as we can, as a network will allow it. So that's why we, we call it instant finality. It's really, really, yeah, as fast as, as fast as the network will allow. And of course, in some scenarios, it will also be probably even faster. Like if you're running this on a private chain, or if you're running this on a testnet that has a very tight meshing between your nodes, you can, you can theoretically reach finality even before the next block is being produced, at least in theory. But this is quite, this is quite fascinating in terms of, of I guess, like a, a piece of technology, like when you're able to reach a uh, finality that fast, that's that's, that's, that's really nice, but this is just one of the benefits of, of hot stuff. We've discussed a little bit, I think two weeks ago, we let, we discussed also what it allowed us to do in terms of, I think Yom was just about to start talking about was the decoupling of different roles that are currently handled by a single entity, the block producer. So in hot stuff, there are, uh, distinct responsibilities we get out, we can, uh, describe. So one is a block proposer. So the block proposer would be the entity that aggregates transactions that are coming into it, into, into a block into, in a certain order. And that's uh, a block that can be added to the block blockchain. And that doesn't mean it's final. It's just the proposal. The, another role, uh, is block finalizer. So block finalizers are the actual key holders that sign to confirm a block. And if there are sufficient signatures kind of spread across phases, then uh, according to the consensus algorithm, a proposed block can be consider considered final. And there comes with proof. It comes with aggregated signatures that act as a proof to any user that according to the consensus algorithm, this block is final. And when the block is final, it means that all prior blocks in the chain up to that point and all the transactions within them are also final. They're irreversible is, a, is another I guess, synonym for that, that uh, is more common in the antelope side of things. And then a third responsibility is specifically in hot stuff is, is consensus leader. And the, the consensus leader is coordinating with the block finalizers to, uh, generate that final uh, proof, which we call a quorum certificate, which is a, a basically you can think of it as a signature um, that convinces the rest of the world that this block is final. But to get to that point requires multiple iterations, multiple rounds of back and forth communication between the consensus leader and the block finalizer. Uh, particularly in hot stuff, it requires this, requires three phases back and forth communication. So the consensus leader is the entity that aggregates all the block finalizers, uh, signatures, uh, we're leveraging ELS signatures, which has this wonderful property that you can take as many signatures as you want and aggregate them together into one signature that, uh, effectively captures the sign, the signature of all the participants in, in one cryptographic signature. It does that process and then returns it back to the people to then build on top of that two more times before we get a uh, final quorum certificate. 
that um, acts as proof of finality. Um, so that's those are the roles. And right now, you could with the current consensus algorithm, you can think of the block producer in EOS as playing as as acting in all of those three roles. And certainly, is the block proposer, the signature that is added onto that block, also acts as a block finalization signature according to the existing consensus algorithm. The consensus leader isn't really necessary in the current consensus algorithm as a role. It's it's more just the block. So the, this is actually the reason why hot stuff is so much faster than the, their current algorithm. The current algorithm, the process of all the block finalizers signing for whichever phase spread across multiple blocks. So you're limited to one block or one or every half second as an opportunity for one block finalizer, block producer, in this case, providing their signature. And then that aggregates over time. Uh, and there's two phases of that before you have essentially accumulated enough signatures for a validating node to now know that this block, you know, at this point, 300 so blocks back in the history of the chain is now considered final, which is why you see this, this lag of 300 something blocks and what's worse is that that scales with the number of block finalizers or, or block producers. So on EOS with 21 block producers, that means if you do the math, it works out to about a three minute gap between the head block and the last irreversible block. But with hot stuff, all this stuff is happening as fast as network conditions allow. So all of the block finalizers are signing in parallel at the same time and they're sending the messages to the consensus leader. And there's a few more rounds of that necessary, but they're happening as soon as the first, the prior round is done. You don't have to wait until a block is produced with the the event-driven hot stuff that we're we're basing this new consensus algorithm on. And so that does require this other role of a consensus leader to manage that. But what it what it gives us is basically a very fast time to finality, a very low time to finality. So that that's a a difference, a key difference between the old and the new algorithm, which explains why this one is much faster. But anyway, going back to the roles, so the block producer, uh, effectively a consensus leader isn't necessary, but the block proposer and block finalizer roles were combined in a single role that we call the block producer. So with hot stuff, we have the opportunity to decouple those. It doesn't mean you have to decouple those. And just to be clear, with the 5.0 upgrade, we are continuing to bundle all of those roles together in in just the block producers that are selected in the same way according to DPoS as they have always been. So this is a, a point that's maybe a little confusing to people, but the way I like to think of it is the consensus algorithm, which is what we're really changing in 5.0, is this, you know, is the is this algorithm that determines finality given a set of consensus participants. It does not tell you how you should determine that set of consensus participants. It doesn't tell you how you should divide up the roles across different entities. It's just the, you know, the core computer science parts of things. The consensus mechanism, how I define it, is this broader concept that builds on top of the consensus algorithm and adds all of the other stuff, like how do you decide on a block proposer, a block finalizer? How do you decide which ones to select? How? What are there? Is there staking involved? Is there voting involved? Is there penalties? You know, the economics of all that get brought in. So we haven't really given a name. Some people called it ABFT for the existing consensus algorithm, but the there's an existing consensus algorithm in Antelope, and then on top of that, there's this consensus mechanism that uses it and and selects the block propo- uh, producers using what is a mechanism that is called DPoS, Delegated Proof of Stake. With 5.0, we are changing the consensus algorithm part of that to a new one that's based on hot stuff, but we're keeping the existing consensus mechanism of DPoS. So that continues just like it has. We still select, and on EOS, we're continuing to still select top 21 block producers. Those block producers would continue to now act as a block proposer and a block finalizer and also a consensus leader in the same way that uh, we we route, we kind of round robin through block proposers. So none of that changes, but what it does give us is the opportunity by changing the foundation to explore, if, if the community is interested, other ways of breaking up those roles. 
There's another thing though I wanted to to bring up and which is quite interesting, of course, as we as we started working on instant fidelity, one of the reasons personally I got interested in the topic was because of course I was working on IBC before that interblockchain communication. And this is now giving us quite a few additional opportunities for IBC as well. The main one being, of course, the ability to shrink, to reduce the time to melody and thus the time for IBC operations from about three minutes to a few seconds. That's already very, very interesting on, on its own. But it also, it also kind of unleashes a new, I guess, a, a, a new paradigm, if you want, in how light clients can interact with, 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 with the blockchain. One of the key feature of, of the instant finality upgrade is we're essentially creating a new API in, in Leap that allows nodes to essentially like provide information about the finality status of the, of the, um, of the, the, of the protocol at any given point. And this can then now be leveraged by these light clients that would want to know what the state of a transaction, for example, they're interested in might be, but without having to necessarily care about all of the other blocks, all of the other content of all the other transactions and so on. So you can, you can think of a number of new, I guess, like ways to build applications that would not necessarily require you to run a full node. You can, you can stay in sync with the network and verify that certain transactions were included and that you can base your activity on, you can essentially take decisions based on these transactions without having to run necessarily the full blown leap software. And that's kind of how we're doing it with instant, uh, with, with IBC. We're essentially having the two, uh, two different blockchains act as light clients of each other. But now with this, with this system, we're able to do that in a way that's a lot more, I guess, like a lot, a lot more convenient from the application standpoint. So this is something I'm really excited about as well. I can see, I can see tons of applications from, you know, a simpler mechanism for exchanges to, for example, list EOS tokens or other tokens built on EOS or other antelope chains. I can see also this being uh, very useful for any dApp developer, really, that has the intention of building something that will require on-chain verification without necessarily wanting to run full nodes and things of the sort. So this is quite this is quite an an important milestone I think for for Leap as well to have the ability and the convenience to do things like this without necessarily running the full full node. So so I don't know I don't know like I don't know yet what we will see that's going to be built on top of that, but I can definitely see a lot of opportunities from a feature like this. Is there anything else that that, that we wanted to discuss, Eric, or should we maybe answer a few questions? I don't know if anyone has any questions so far. For some questions, yeah, um, I would definitely want to hear what uh, Gam's opinion is on this question, but I'll I'll give it a shot. So, this question is why why don't you think uh, many chains have adopted how stuff is so good? Where are the downsides? So, I don't have like a, a great answer to this, but I'll give you my my opinion and my speculation. So, one one of the things I think is relevant here is just the chronology of all this. Like, people adopt consensus algorithms that seem pretty good at the time and then there's further development that happens and then there's sort of inertia that <laughs> limits people from upgrading something that seems to be working well enough newer chains may be have this opportunity to you know, choose the latest state of the art and adopt that there are there are chains out there that have faster finality you know low time to finality even if they're not using hot stuff there's different various other approaches that may be okay. One thing to keep in mind is there have been further attempts of improvements on top of hot stuff. We have evaluated some of those, but decided we're not, they're, they're fairly new and there's a risk associated with that because it's really important to have a system that is sound, that is that's safe and, you know, has, you know, the papers prove safety and liveness. As you make tweaks to that, there's a risk that you're going to compromise that. So there's other advantages there's other you know versions that built on top of hot stuff changed it in some ways claim to improve it but there's a question of does it compromise the safety or, or liveness properties that are desirable in hot stuff and so we made a decision that some of these advantages weren't um 
worth it for the risk of going for something kind of unproven. We wanted to stick with something that was well established, seems to be uh, pretty straightforward in terms of having confidence in its properties and its proofs. And that still works well enough. I mean, we're talking basically, uh, we're talking about very fast time, to, very fast process, low time to finality, basically driven by network conditions, really than anything else. One other thing I'll mention is like some networks, can, we could bring like Casper, like there's this legacy of using proof of work as the block proposal mechanism, if I can kind of bring it back to these roles, but then a gadget on top of that to create to add finality. And they have their reasons for wanting to keep that. But given the latency kind of constraints that come with the block proposal mechanism, it doesn't necessarily make sense to take advantage of things like optimistic responsiveness and some of the nice properties of hot stuff in that case. Now, why would they stick with that? I think there's an argument to be made that they make an argument, whether I agree with it or not, that this opens up like a, like a different a different algorithm for block proposal like proof of work might open it up to anyone, create more decentralization perhaps in the block proposal side, even if ultimately finality is is determined by some more closed off set of entities. For us, looking at the history of EOS, we have been operating with with this uh, system where we have a, a restricted a set of entities that are are somewhat trusted selected by delegations selected by by the stakeholders the token holders and they have been acting as the block proposers and block finalizers and so there doesn't it that seems to be you know somewhat accepted so the block proposers being a set of say 21 or around there could be more but roughly around their number of entities that are trusted seems to be working fine with EOS. And in that sense, there's no need to have a more, like there's, we're not moving to a more system, for example. And so we already have a very fast way of coming to, to uh, a block proposal and micro forks do happen, but they're very unlikely. So with that, I think the advantages that Hosta provides become far more realizable for EOS and say some other chain like Ethereum. The other thing though to mention that is is that that's the current case with EOS, but hot stuff, because of its linear signatures, the linear size, the, the, the BLS signatures, which allow for linearly aggregatable signatures, means that we can with far bandwidth uh, uh, issues, we can handle a much larger set of finalizers than we've been able to handle before. So this does open up the opportunity to increase the size of those of those sets, particularly the block finalizer set is uh, um, something that could be uh, considerably increased without hurting performance. So this does open up opportunity to uh, add to that decentralization if that was desired. There we go. Trimbot coming in with a question here. Can we discuss the IBC potential with non-antelope chains? Is that something that's going to be eventually possible? So, yeah, one thing we talk about with, with regards to that is we were evaluating. Okay, so hot stuff does require, you know, for, for its performance needs, for its scaling needs, it does require a cryptographic scheme for the signatures that allow you to aggregate them together. This, I, I refer, referenced this before with the linearly aggregatable signatures, a milestone that was recently completed, by the way, by Guillaume State. So that's going to be in. That's another protocol feature that's going to be in, in Leap, uh, Leap 5.0. We're in the process of integrating that into the main branch right now. We decided, though, there's there's a few different options there, and we decided to go with BLS 12.381 specifically, and there's a whole new library that was developed by the Origin team and for this. So the reason we went with that, and in fact, also the reason we when with the design for the host functions that's very similar to, well, is basically identical to an, the interface in an EIP and Ethereum, is because Ethereum 2.0 supports the same cryptographic key. And so we intentionally chose that particular one because it enables, let me back up a bit. So IBC requires on both ends of the 
chains that are communicating. Let's say there's a source chain and a destination chain. On both chains, you need to have code, a contract, I guess, that will be able to validate the proofs of the consensus algorithm of the other chain. So the one of the consensus upgrades that are going to be in Leap 5.0 are exposing the host functions that are going to be used by an Antelope smart contract, also being developed by Yum's team, to validate these uh, quorum certificates, which require doing uh, BLS signature validations. That's going to be needed for validating messages from from other Antelope chains that are going to be using the same instant finality mechanism. But then the the messages that are being sent by, say, EOS to another chain also uh, need to be validated by the quorum certificates that are generated by instant finality on EOS. And so now when we're talking about IBC with another blockchain like Ethereum, we need to be able to validate those quorum certificates of EOS on an Ethereum smart contract. And that, and yes, while technically Turing complete, you could run anything in theory. The reality is if you don't have the right pre-compiles, it's not, uh, especially if you're trying to do cryptographic math, it's going to be too slow, too gas intensive. That is just not economical. So we intentionally chose BLS. Uh, it satisfied our requirement, made a lot of sense. But one of the other benefits of that is that it would allow us to use the same pre-compiles uh, that we're going to be using on, on EOS uh, on the Ethereum side so that the IBC contracts there could validate EOS's proofs. So yeah, we, we, there's no milestone as part of the IF or IBC work to build such contracts, but the technology, the, how we built the both the IF and IBC milestones enables us to now more easily support IBC between Ethereum and EOS. Well, in the future, when IF is enabled anyway, it en enables that. So, hi, maybe maybe I can comment just a little bit. So, you only basically talked about Ethereum validating EOS proofs, right? The other way around, it might not be as easy. I mean, it's, it's of it's of course doable, but it's like a lot of uh, a lot more proofs to validate. Well, because the so so. It, with, with them using BLS, because we have the host functions anyway for validating proofs between Antelope chains, we could leverage those same host functions to validate Ethereum's proofs as well. Is Ethereum using uh, BLS as well for their proofs, for their fidelity? I believe that's the case, yeah, Ethereum 2.0. So that was regarding Ethereum and really anything else that's actually using BLS 12, 381, any other chain like that could could, we would have the necessary foundations to quickly validate proofs on either side that could expose that could enable IBC between potentially other chains beyond that. BTC is a completely different story. I, I know that Guillaume has talked about has ideas about how that could be done in a trustless way. Obviously, you know, if you're willing to give up if you're willing to trust and and have some sort of third party do things, then a lot of things become easier with regards to IBC. But the standard we're aiming for is trustless. The standard we're aiming for is to, to not add any more trust than the trust people already have for the consensus algorithm of the source chain. So that that limits what you could do in terms of trustless uh, IBC between EOS and Bitcoin, unfortunately. I know, I, I know Guillaume had some ideas there, but I have, I'm not really aware if it's actually possible or not in a trustless manner. So that was kind of in reference to Trayvon Bot's question of the Karashi index of ETH, BTC, and USD. So the, you know, the tokens live on these different blockchains. ETH on Ethereum, that's fine if we have a Ethereum EOS IBC connection in a trustless way. But the, and then of course, we already have USDT on, on EOS. But yeah, the, the limits of getting other tokens across in a trustless way de de depends on the IBC also being trustless, which is question, which is something that's you have to take on a case by case basis for every particular blockchain technology and the consensus algorithm it uses. Is there, was there another question I'm, I'm missing? I think it's it so far. Oh, oh, here's one from Perry. The new host of roles. Um, so the question is about whether these uh, new roles create specialized hardware requirements for block producers. So the so once again, the roles, while the, the foundation allows them to be decoupled, with 5.0, we're continuing to keep them all coupled as a block producer. So nothing changes there. 
one of the things that's interesting but highly speculative at this point is if we were to decouple block production from block finalization, for example, then could if uh, block so block finalization itself is not a intensive process, but you don't want to finalize blocks that are not valid because uh, part of finality as well is this attestation by the finalizers that this block is a valid blockchain, is the head of a valid blockchain. So block validation is what's more resource intensive. If there is a potential to maybe reduce the hardware intensity, intensity the, the hardware requirements for a block validator, for example, if we could find ways to parallelize it more, this is all speculative imp leap implementation. So if there there's a way to parallelize validation more so you can use, say, lower clock cycle, but more core, uh, a machine that has more cores, but lower clock cycles and still keep up with validation. And, and maybe those machines cost less. Then that's an opportunity where a block finalizer could potentially run on cheaper hardware than what a block proposer uses. Uh, and and if, if so, that's again, a great opportunity to expand the number of block finalizers without necessarily expanding the number of block proposers. Because remember, yes, we could throw more we can increase the numbers and claim we're more decentralized question if that's actually true or not, but it does come at a, a linearly increasing cost increase because you're going to have to compensate those nodes that are now being expending resources to, to validate things in, a, in an available matter. So there's a trade-off there of how much decentralization is worth it. If we could find ways to use decoupling to be more efficient with the, the hardware costs, then the trade-off point or the optimal point could be shifted further towards a, a more decentralized number. But that's highly speculative, so I don't want to comment too much more beyond that at this point. I don't, so I don't know how much uh, longer you'd like me to continue versus going, to other, going on to other topics. I think this was pretty good. I think you covered most of the questions here that I saw. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I think we can I think we can wrap up the, the segment here. Thanks a lot uh, for joining us, Arig. Thank you, Yom, as well. For joining us when your internet allowed you to do so and yeah i'm sure we'll we'll continue uh to hear more about this upgrade that's coming on later in the year